welcome to a bonus session of the One Year No Beer podcast. We were just, we were reflecting on how incredible the guests have been in series three. And truly, right, some of those conversations with people are fundamentally life-changing. If you apply those principles, if you put them into action, if you learn them, if you go all in this, it will change your life. This is a life-changing podcast. So I didn't want to just let them disappear into the shelves and collect dust like those old books that I've read years ago. No, let's bring them back out. Let's bring out the special parts, the best bits, and compile them into this bonus session. So our wonderful podcast team went back over these past episodes and picked out the nuggets, the gold, the real gems that you can hold on to. So this is a very, very special episode. I will say, if this episode resonates with you, then why not share it? Why not post it somewhere? Why not give it to a friend and help them? Because most people are trying to reconsider their relationship with alcohol. Most people are thinking they wish they could just drink a little bit less. So if you find this inspirational, or if you find this insightful, then please do share it. Right, well, without further ado, let's hear from some of the incredible guests we had in Series 3. So when you brought meditation into your life, what started to happen for you? Well, I started to see (laughs) how crazy my mind was. I can say this as a psychiatrist, you know, it's like, wow, my mind was all over the place. And I had no idea that that was normal. And then that was actually okay. I also started to notice how I was running after my mind, trying to hold on to pleasant things and push away unpleasant things. And that I was actually causing a huge amount of my own suffering through that you know, frenetic activity of trying to control my mind. Mm. The irony here was that, you know, letting go was the ultimate form of control when it comes to my mind. Um, That is where most people are, what you just described, isn't it? This is where most people are, is they're stuck in a loop of causing their own suffering. Yeah, and they don't know it, right? Most people don't know that this is actually a habit. You know, I've got story after story of patients in my clinic who come in, you know, they have no idea what's causing their anxiety their, or their addiction. I had somebody that was actually referred for alcohol use, you know, where he'd been drinking six to eight hard drinks a night. And as we started mapping out this process, he realized that it was actually, you know, he'd wake up in the morning, he'd feel anxious. He would watch movies. He worked from home. He watched movies to procrastinate from all the work he needed to get done. And then he realized that the procrastination didn't get the work done. So he started, he would start drinking in the afternoon and into the evening. And then, of course, not get work done when he was, you know, when he was inebriated. And then wake up the next morning and do the same thing over. And so he had to treat the root cause of his issue, which was anxiety. And the, you know, as he, when he started treating that, when he started addressing that directly, the drinking for him fell away uh, much, much more easily than trying to say, okay, just stop drinking, which is the Mm. standard, (laughs) you know, avoid those people, places, and things, you know, (laughs) to which I say, good luck. You know, it's not always easy to do. Patients often ask, well, if my ultimate goal is to drink less and not to abstain, can't I just cut back? Now, what I say to them is, number one, cutting back from high heavy use is harder, actually, than just quitting. Totally. Um, and number two, if you cut back but you don't quit, you will never fully reset reward pathways. You'll always be in a little bit of a dopamine deficit state. So you'll always be in a state of partial craving. Whereas if you stop completely, you reset reward pathways, you're coming to the project of moderation or controlled drinking or controlled consumption from a real place of strength where you've got nice, healthy dopamine levels and you've got other things that you enjoy. Because what happens in our addiction is that we stop enjoying anything else and we're only focused on using our our drug of choice. Um, The I of dopamine stands for insight. And one of my favorite things in doing this exercise is how people will come back four weeks after abstaining. They'll be like, wow, I can't believe how much better I feel. I thought that my drug was fixing this problem, but I realize now that it was actually making that problem worse. So this is this kind of moment of great insight. The other thing that's always amazing is, well, people will look back at the amount of time, energy, money, creativity they were investing in their drug, and they'll be like, I don't recognize that. Per- like, who was that? You know, that's not me, and that's it's not consistent with my values. So it really shows us that we get caught in it, you know, and we lose perspective. 
And that, yeah. so getting that distance from that black hole that's sucking us in can can be a real revelatory. Why do why do people drink? The first thing you go when you go to a party is you have a glass of alcohol. Why? Because a party is a social situation where you meet people you don't know, and humans are most humans are engineered to be slightly anxious and cautious about the people they don't know, um, and uh, that makes parties pretty boring if you won't talk to someone else because you're not sure. But alcohol relaxes that, and that's why it's such a great social drug. So we said let's just target the GABA system. Now that has huge advantages because if you don't tar target any of the other systems, you know you can r get rid of all the problems like addiction, dependence, hangover, toxicity in the liver, etc. The other interesting thing about the GABA system is it's really complicated. And I think a lot of people say oh, it's too complicated. There's 15 different kinds of GABA receptors. But it turns out that complexity is an advantage because there are different receptors in different parts of the brain. So if you know which receptors in the bit of the brain that you want to target, which is the frontal parts of the brain, where you do your anxiety, your worry, your social interactions, if you just target those, those receptors, it might be challenging to do it, but you can do it. Uh, and then you've actually got this amazing specificity as well. Well, you know, stress is kind of complicated because it is, we like to say, it's actually an organ system. It's a whole biology that's wired to help us cope and adapt and survive in the world. And actually, I like to say survive and thrive and flourish because there's a very nice, you know, positive, protective side to the whole system. So I start there because, I, you know, we've really grappled with well, what it is, how does this actually get started? So you see somebody coming, you know, an animal. How does it get started? Or somebody's pointing a gun at you. What happens to you? And people generally start that. It's a highly acute stress response, right? Or you're in a work situation and there's a deadline that was 2 p.m. and it just got moved up to noon. What happened? Well, just notice, do the exercise with me. Just notice what happens to your body. It's not... A sequential thing like, oh dear, I got stressed. Oh, let's see. Now my heart is beating. Oh, wait. Now I'm thinking, what should I do? That is not, that would be not be a, a very efficient way for a system to work. So one big change that, that we've, um, that science has, has led to is that this is actually what I call parallel distributed processing. It's a multi-level, immediate, all systems go kind of alarm system that goes off, right? So you see something, our sensory systems are very good at processing this. Immediately, you've got the signal to your heart and to your stomach, and this is where variation happens. You might be a heart kind of guy. I might be a stomach kind of person, you know? So my stomach clenches up. Somebody else gets pain right away in their neck. And so you start to have this alarm system going off. And that same thing happens in the brain. So there's a parallel process in the brain that alerts our emotional systems. It alerts our uh, behavioral systems, like do something, let's save yourself. So yes, that's your fight or flight. But there's so much more that humans do. In fact, fight or flight is sort of, has not helped us because it's as if, oh, pack that up. That's all you either run and you, and that's all you did. And the rest of it is your know, cognition and you're so smart and you figure everything out. Well, not really, because we, have a system to notice our emotions, to say, oh, well, wait a minute, this person is, seems pretty upset. If you just take a moment, you might notice a few more features of that. There's not really a danger here, or, or there is a danger, whatever assessment you're doing. But you have to give your brain some time. So anyway, there's a parallel process going on. And if we react quickly, one downside of this whole thing, and you've heard about habit or you've heard about routines, this brain of ours is a very efficient system. So if you don't have to, if you don't have to wait, you're just going to go for something, you know, and you just go for it. Attention is a precious resource. We can't, we can't allocate it so easily. We, in fact, most things, I say this to people, but 90% of things that we do as humans, and this is a surprise for folks, happens without our full awareness. Which is do them because we've got a computer up here and it sort of processes things. And of course, it's going to go based on learning. So if your learning was, hey, you know what? After tough work, they were all going to go to the bar because we all relax. You're just going to go ahead and do it. 
Let's pause just for a brief moment. I just want to share with you some of the heartfelt feedback from our incredible Complete Control community members. Listen to this. I, I don't know how I signed up. I think I just got an ad on Instagram and just got a whim, just hit the button and did a call and then signed up and didn't really consciously think much about it. And then after that, I was like, what did I just sign up for? Wait a second here. Like far exceeded my expectations. I'm usually extremely skeptical. So I don't know how I even signed up in the first place, but whatever it was. Um, so it's just amazing how like the transformation that I've seen and even the drinking part is just kind of the super, it, it was the Achilles heel, but it's kind of just the superficial problem. And it's like, once I kind of clear that up, there's so much more possibility and, and, you know, the exploration discussions with Gary, with Candace have just been so powerful and kind of, they both kind of focus on a different area. And then with Glenn kind of looking at my data and with my co cohorts or classmates or, you know, it's just been just, everything has just been so powerful and kind of supportive of, you know, completing the whole picture of how I do this. Um, so just really grateful and, and, uh, yeah. And, and, and also just feel more grateful and not only just for all of you, but just, just in life in general, it's just a little bit more clarity and peace and calm and, and, and so forth. So I am incredibly grateful for this entire program, everybody on this call and everything that we were able to experience. Um, I think that it delivered more than I expected. Honestly, I, I, like I've said before, I've done a couple of like challenges and different things. And I think that this beyond, um, examining my relationship with alcohol and making, I think pretty good strides in, in, um, staying alcohol free. Um, I think it taught me a ton about myself and how to like examine my habits and my thoughts and those kind of, um, patterns and, ways to ways to approach the things that worried me the most in this in this experience um have just been invaluable i think i'm leaving feeling um in stronger in general more self-aware in general and um just really more anchored in who i want to be and what my values are and how i can you know take better steps to achieve those so it's been fantastic for me. And again, the, our team, I, I really um, appreciate all the feedback and support from every single person on this call, but my cohort as well. It's been great. So I love everybody that I've met here. I have loved the program. I am not uh, an emotional person like this, but this has changed my life. It, it, it has given me a life. Um, and there's other things I need to do too, um, but I don't have to do a call call anymore. So Thank you. It's been an amazing journey and a very, I appreciate the professionalism. Whenever I feel the stress, I, there's there's something that I can go back to, to everybody and the sharing from everybody and the professionalism of the program. So I loved it and I've grown a lot. So ups and kisses. One word is transformational. That's a word that's been bandied about for decades, but in this, it is absolutely accurate, if I was to use one word. This was a great investment. It's not, it's not self-help, it's self-realization. It's um, super powerful, but it, it exceeded my expectations. Or maybe it was Sharon who said that, um, uh, or maybe I'm exceeding my expectations, and I like that. I mean, the program has been hugely, a huge growth at some program. I think the journey of, for myself, has been amazing. I mean, I remember telling, I don't know if it was Candice or Gary, the first three or four weeks of the program, I was like, I can't stop thinking about not drinking. It's just, it's in my head. I'm ha Every day I'm thinking about not drinking. And it's it's like now, I'm not even thinking about it. You know, it's just like my life has sort of stepped on. I'm excited about the future. Um, things are looking good. Things are looking good. I just love sharing the things people are saying about our complete control program. Okay, let's get back into the episode. When we live a life that requires significant amounts of hard work, so say you're someone that wakes up, you make your bed, you have your shower, you're quite disciplined, 
you work hard, you go to the gym, you put an effort with your family, you do things that are hard, your brain is thinking, okay, this is someone that's going to require a significant amount of natural dopamine production because I need to support them to have the motivation to live this life they want. And gradually, when you live a life of effort, your baseline begins to rise and rise. And a high baseline dopamine feels like a very productive, excited, happy state. On the other side, if you're waking up, you're going to the social media, your food's crap, your booze is high. Effectively, when we're talking about revving that engine, you start burning out the production of it and the brain goes, can't cope anymore, I can't, I can't produce. So the baseline begins to drop into a more apathetic state in a very similar way to how kind of type 2 diabetes works. You know, you eat too much sugar and fat and then suddenly your body can't produce insulin because you, you break the mechanism. We effectively type 2 diabetes in our dopamine. In the brain. <laughs> If I look at all the guys, I think at this point in time, I've, we've taken two, 300 guys through the program and everybody's situation is different and everybody's situation is similar to some degree. I've had guys who are in complete and total separations. I have one guy right now, I'll leave his name out, started our program separation with the beginning stages of divorce. And here's where I tell, here's what I tell guys when they apply and we, and we talk about what the program is. I always tell these guys, I'm like, listen, listen, man, this is not a silver bullet. I will never, ever, ever promise a guy, you come and learn this stuff with me and I will save your marriage. No way. <laughs> right? No way. I was like, but here's what I will promise you. You know, you go to like, I, I don't gamble. Okay, I don't gamble. And I'll tell you why, Rory. I don't know how to gamble. I'm not good at it. I might as well just go right up to the guy, the dealer's the blackjack table, hand him my $100 bill and be like, here, I, I would have paid you this in two minutes. Yeah, but, so it doesn't matter. That's the truth. But that's because I, right, that's because I don't know how. And plus, the odds are always stacked in the house's favor. Now, if I read books on blackjack strategy and I learn how to play and I practice and I know the strategies, I'm looking at everybody else's card and I'm looking at the dealer's cards and I'm, I, I, I make the best choices based on the strategy and the things that I see, well, then the odds are more stacked in my favor that I could win. It's not guaranteed, but the odds are higher that I could win. And this is what I tell guys. I'm like, this will not be the silver bullet that saves your marriage. Number one, you got to do the work. She's got to be willing to do the work. But number two, you know, that's not to say it's going to work. But dude, I am here to tell you, I have one guy in my class right now, we're five weeks into this. His wife has moved back in. They are no longer separated and divorce is now off the table. Of these things you you, you mentioned about, you know, like um, the traits of ADHD, why don't you share another personal story or personal type of behavior that you think you would have, if you were listening to this, you would resonate with that and go, oh, wow, that is me. Think, think. Given most of us have to go to work Monday to Friday, nine to five, to earn a living and survive and pay the mortgage or the rent and, and, and what have you, I think for me personally, the the big change has been in the workplace because I've known what my strengths are now and I know where I struggle and what I'm not good at and, and, and therefore what used to cause me anxiety and what used to cause me, I mean, I was, uh, I was before I was diagnosed, Rory, I remember going to work in um, a good job. It was in recruitment when I was recruiting in the maritime sector. Um, I was the third highest billing consultant in our organization out of 120 consultants, UK, Singapore, and Houston. Um, I'd be crying on the way to work in my car because I just did not want to go and face work. I did not want to go and do what I was doing. I had such a lack of self-worth and, and lack of belief in self, um, suicidal thoughts, um, mm. you know, and that's still, I don't want, I'm learning now how to deal with those. To process those, yeah. Yeah, because you still, you still wrestle with them. You still <laughs> tell myself, these are, it's just your mind, just yeah. park it, yeah. um, you know, and, and that's only when there's challenging times, but for like, I realize it's, 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 it's not something that I would, I would attempt and I have attempted, thankfully my grandfather did and he was successful, sadly. Oh God. Um, but the, for me, the big learning and the key takeaway has been ensuring, and there's a lot of what we're doing in the charity as well is talking to organizations around and businesses around how they can, how, how you can embrace ADHD in the workplace to ensure that the environment that you have 
it's di diverse in general, not just for ADHD. It needs to be diverse for, you know, equality, diversity, and inclusion is a real hot topic. And, and we're seeing that. I'm seeing that in my working day because it's what I do. It's recruitment, it's exec search. We work with organizations to help them around their EDI agenda and that hiring process. But for me, understanding what I'm good at so I can have that hyper focus in the day job so they then get the best out of me, I then get the best out of myself, um, and it then helps stop the anxiety um, that would come with knowing I've got to go and do a job where I don't feel I belong, people don't understand me, I'm going to be doing tasks, and look, I still have to do tasks I don't like. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think for me, the, a, a big key piece has been, like, since diagnosis, I've been thriving in my in my job and you know i feel i feel i feel i can be authentic the thing about drinking is it's so ingrained in society that so much of it now is linked subconsciously to your identity your belief about yourself we've spent decades becoming a certain type of drinker becoming a certain brand right and and you're like oh well i'm this i'm that and people say i'm this a whiskey drinker, a vodka drinker, a fast drinker, a short drinker, a party guy, a non-party guy, you know, sit out drinking all wine all evening person, whatever it is. Um, and so society has these expectations about us. And then when we try to change our relationship with alcohol, what we do is go, do you know what, guys, I've had enough of the way you're behaving. I'm going to go over here and be different like this. Well, <laughs> our innate, very tribal way of being says that when we left the tribe, we died. We got eaten by that saber-toothed tiger. So everything about you is is saying, well, hang on a minute. I'm trying to stop drinking, which is boring, dull. You know, I, I it's, it's a challenge. I don't like it. And it's nothing like my whole tribe over here. And I'm trying to be somebody weird. And they're saying, what's wrong with you? Come back, have a drink. You know, don't leave the tribe. It's unsafe over there. And we become more disconnected. I love the fact that, um, you know, if I choose to, I can have a glass of wine if if I choose to, but it's a choice yeah. now. Like yeah. one of the big things that I take out as a post-it note on my desk, which says uh, alcohol-free is now my default position. And it takes bravery to have that position because it is completely contrary to the way that most Anglo-Saxon countries live, right? We spend $6 billion a year advertising alcohol. So mm. you try and avoid those messages. It's impossible, right? And particularly, well, there's this social conditioning piece as well. How do you celebrate? How do you mourn? How do you, oh, you've just, you know, got a big deal at work. Great. Go buy the most expensive bottle of wine and drink it by yourself at home. Yeah. You know, I, I think for me, I discovered that although, you know, you can buy whatever you want, but the cost is way too high. You know, so much of our culture revolves around drinking. Every commercial makes it look so great. Everything shows it as as glorious and beautiful and all the people are dressed up and everybody's model looking and stuff like that. And you know what? Yes, they all look like that, but they don't look like that the next morning. <laughs> and that's what we we think we're going to be is is fun. And you know what? I got past, once I got past that fear, I realized it wasn't about that. It wasn't about the liquor. It was about me. And, you know, I have gone to day-long music festivals. I have gone to sporting events. I have gone to tailgates. I have gone to bars. I have gone to parties. I have done all this. And with the tools that I have learned, even when it's in the back of my mind going, oh, you know what, why don't you have a drink? It's like, all right, let's let's just wait 15 minutes or so. And if you still want it, we'll talk about that. And it goes away. Or you, you have something alcohol-free. And you know what? People still want to hang around with me. I have very good friends and I have good family. And you, have a, you can have a support system, but it's not like the support system that you have when you're in this program. It's just not. People get it. They get you, they get what it feels like to be like that. And all of a sudden, like, you're getting emotional at something you would have never gotten emotional before because you realize you're not alone. Now, it turns out with over 300 people through the program that most of those people either go to a place where they completely leave it because they're done and they've had enough, or 
they have a take it or leave it relationship with alcohol. In fact, early results are saying that 78% of people have chosen to remain alcohol free and 22% are in a place of take it or leave it, which is amazing. It's phenomenal. But those are early results and we're looking forward to publishing in scientific studies the evidence that we are gathering. So what are those core drivers? Number one, the driver for the vast majority of us, the thing that is creating compulsion and we don't even realize it, is our past experiences as a child. Now, normally, we all have things that can happen later in our lives that drive these feelings. But when we're between zero and seven years old, our prefrontal cortex has not yet switched on. And that's the melon just behind our forehead. Now, that area of the brain is used for rational decision-making. Okay, so today, when somebody says, you're an idiot, you're like, oh, that's somebody who hasn't slept well. That's the prefrontal cortex rationalizing. But as a child, when somebody shouts at you, when somebody spanks you, when somebody leaves you alone to cry it out, when you are denied love from a parent, when you're bullied, all of those things, they are significantly impactful because we cannot rationalize them. Let's just pause for a second and reflect on where you are right now, but more importantly, where this goes if you don't get on top of it. I feel that feeling. You know, that's a shitty freaking place, right? It's just, it's shit. And a lot of it's happening on autopilot. And more importantly, if you've been trying other things and you've tried and tried and not got there, like, this is not good. It's, it's, it builds even more going in the wrong direction. That's why we need to take massive action because this vision, the vision of where you want to go, how great did that feel? It feels amazing, right? It feels empowering. It feels strong. It feels true. It feels like you. And I say this to people all the time. Trying to create different versions of people is really difficult. It's, it's incredibly challenging because they revert back. Trying to open people back to the true version of themselves, that is easy. Because it's at their core, at their belief, at their morals, at their very fabric. That is where we want to get people to. And don't forget, if you want to know more about Complete Control, just click the links below or click the links in the show notes or head to oneyearnobeer.com, click on Complete Control, and you can book into a call with the team and find out all about the program and how it can benefit you in a significant way. I've heard many, many people call it profoundly life-changing. We do amazing things here at One Year No Beer. So if you want to check out Complete Control, we'd love to take you on that journey.